Hello again, it's Fighting Fifteens and it's been five and a half, six hours since this went into the vulcanizer and it's been allowed to cool down a little so it drops to about 65 to 70 degrees centigrade. I'm now going to just screw in the bolts into the appropriate holes in the mould to take the top of the mould can off and get to the vulcanised rubber mould inside. So you just hand tighten those. There are different ways of opening mould cans. Some you can just lever out. Um, this one is quite a tight fit and I've never been able to lever out the top. Um, in theory, you could take a big screwdriver and, and lever, but it doesn't work for me. So I use the bolts always warned you could strip the thread on these. Um, it has never happened. That's all I can say. Um, if you want an appropriate spanner for the um, bolts, this is actually a lawnmower spanner. It just happens to hit uh, the absolutely right size for um, these bolts. And you t take them up, turn at a time, evenly just like you're tighten or loosen the nuts on the wheel of a car if you're changing a tire so that it's all done evenly so you don't un undo one at a time so what we're doing is winding the bolts down to force the top plate away from the hole of the can and you'll probably feel it suddenly go as it all releases from the sides and bottom of the mould. Now, the reason I'm doing this hot, and this is why I'm wearing rigger gloves, um, is so that I'm hoping there's still enough stick between this top plate of the mould and the actual silicon of the mould to pull the rubber out still attached to this. And that makes it slightly easier to get it out of the can because you're only taking it off a plate but I think that's actually just released so take it off and they are stuck down in in there right um, you can see that the little lug has pretty well fully formed there it's just with some talcs um, got a bit crusty that it stayed in and you can see some rough lines where the vents were but actually it's just a mark and there's no um, real harm done so if your mould is stuck down here, I must just have polished the top of the mould too much at the moment, a mould can to actually release it. Um, you need something like a, a very heavy duty screwdriver to release the mould. Now, the reason why I put in the locking nuts um, on the bolt holes, so I know that when I drive a screwdriver down, I'm not going to, if I went there, I would go down and I would catch one of the nuts. So I'm actually gonna go slightly to one side and you basically push down this is brute and lever up and you'll hear it go and then you do the same again and again and the idea is to loose you can hear it go I just to loosen it from the base so that if you turn it over you can see it's almost going to fall out because the mushroom has sunk just a little bit of push with a thumb that's it it's out so that was a fairly trouble free um, way of getting the mould out um, screwdriver never do marks side of the can but that's not the crucial part of the mould you want the surfaces to be flat right so having got that seeing where one of your marks is you can then safely drive a screwdriver in there don't go too far because you can catch the figure with the screwdriver and mark it and that will ruin one of your production masters or worse a master figure if you're doing a master mold and I just do that prize it apart and taking care not to, that's for 
location. I do normally I just pick this up and peel it apart, but I'm showing you the gradual way of doing it. So you gradually take it apart from the parting line. You can see there that's where one of the V notches was in the top, and the bottom rubber has come up slightly as it's all gone formed in. That actually helps lock the mould together and provides another way of making sure that oh, that's obviously got a nut too close to the edge. So what, what I say you need to leave a gap. So we're just going to now pull that apart and there we have oh, random sword and arm, um, the mould and bend the mould slightly Pop out the originals, bang the nut out, the mushroom even, and there we are. So just clip out. I say this is hot, this is why I'm wearing gloves. Um, 70 degrees is enough to burn you, so you have to be careful. Uh, you can take a normal metal wax tool to these or a smaller screwdriver to get them out if they're being obstinate um, which eventually you find they oh. right it's almost there and remember those are hot so just put them aside to cool down and there we are that's the two halves of a mould, um, all ready for cutting. Now, it's actually best done warm. Um, but the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find the location, let's match those up. Just double check where it is. And then I'm gonna use a fairly round liner cutter. A notch in the outside of a mould. Okay, now that, so when you've got two mould halves apart, especially against the dark background, you can see where the mould lines up. So for putting it back together again. Right, uh, next, uh, a Swan Morton scalpel, which is my preferred tool for mould cutting and a 10A blade. Now this one's an old blade, so I'm gonna take it off. But each mold, you should use a new blade. This is a handy device from Swan Walton to remove scalpel blades without major surgery happening to your fingers. And get a fresh blade out. A 10 a very useful blade. Um, I was originally taught how to do this with a uh, Stanley knife and a uh, Stanley knife with one of those um, blades you can break off a new section. There are, they are a butcher's tool, basically. They will do the job, but they will do it quite crudely. So this will allow you to do much finer work. And the first thing to do, you can just run it's very hard to show because I'm, I'm right-handed and I need to be left-handed to show this. You just take off a little bit of excess rubber from around the edge of the mould. That'll help it lie flat in the casting machine. Right, next. The mushroom can leave a little lip there and it's good practice just to take that little bit off. It provides, means there's less mould to catch and tear. Okay, so that's that done. Right, now the next stage is, if you remember those, long ago, you can just about see the marks there from the compass I put when I was laying out the mould. And we're going to use this as a starting point, And we're going to put the mould, the knife in at shallow angle, possibly about 30 degrees, 
and then we're going to cut using the mark as a guide. It's approximate, you begin to lose sight of it. Again, working with cream, it's one disadvantage. You can't clearly see a lot of things that happen. So coming up to mark, and we should be at oh, the court seven, the end. And when we're going to do the same again, the other way round, this is a lot harder. I've just goofed there. Um, so that's one you have to turn the knife, not the mould. You can see it's lifting away from the mould. It won't be perfect, the guides of it, you know, just a rough idea of where I wanted to put it. Um, so we have a, a channel. Um, there are different ways to cut a mould. This is just one of them. You can do direct feeds to everything. Uh, if you've got lots of objects of different sizes in a mould, um, separate feeds is uh, the easiest way to do the mould. Uh, when you've got a lot of the same thing in a mould, this is a very effective way. And I think there's some advantages on, on metal flow when you cut the gates. But first of all, to take our dino cutter and I'm going to cut the channels for the metal to flow down into this beam channel. Um, I use a liner cutter because it's curved. There are therefore no nicks into rubble. That has created a nick which in time will no doubt wear and tear. Silicon tears relatively easily. Um, so this is a way of increasing the life of your mould by not cutting into um, these into this part of the rubber. Um, you can cut into the bottom of the mould but this bit is often quite thin so if you start cutting a lot into the centre of this you can cut through or weaken the mould so severely that you'll reduce the mould life. Um, so I always cut into the top half of the mould um, because I feel it will give me longer mould life. Now, where I cut these is basically on the gap between figures. That means there's not a direct feed to the horse. And it's basically just a question, actually this is best done with a leather glove on because you're going to push something sharp into your finger. So that, and we just work round cutting the mould form basically. Um, you can buy mould forms for different mould cans which will make this for you automatically as part of the vulcanising process but cutting your own gives you more flexibility according to the size of the items you're cast or making a mould of and casting and just find it's more versatile being able to cut your own. Um, although I've used a fresh blade on the scalpel, this lino cutting blade has been going for years. I occasionally replace them because it's not doing any seriously detailed cutting. It's just going there and cutting the channels. Um, if I were cutting a direct feed, I would also cut it with a lino cutter to say there on figure and then drive to the centre. Um, again, to minimise the number of actual nicks I put into the rubber and to reduce the likelihood of the mould tearing. So, excuse me, I'll just get this done. I'm not really that used to trying to present it to a camera, so I hope you can see what's happening. And that's the next bit. So that's in essence what's going to happen. Your mould, you're going to 
the metal's going to drop down there when you're spin casting and it's going to flow out to there and round here. Now, the theory is that the metal will come up here and it will then flow, I've got to think which way, flow that way round and you kind of cut some gates into the horses. And the idea is the metal will come up and go up that one first, force some of the air out through the last one before it actually sort of starts feeding metal up there. So it's, it's a, something I've learned from looking at the hobby products moulds from uh, the Gladiator Miniatures range, which I acquired. All the moulds are cut in that way. They all work with very little venting and you just have to admire the craft of the person who did that. Right, I need to get a magnifier to see what I'm doing because I haven't got good enough eyesight and it is quite dark. So I haven't got any natural daylight. I'm doing this entirely under artificial light. Okay, well, I'm back and I have my fetching magnifiers on my reading glasses. These I, find I use for painting and all close-up work. Now, I said, this is important to use as the basis for where you start on anything, and it's particularly true when you're cutting um, kiss gates and feeds into the actual figure. A kiss gate is the bit that basically comes into a figure like that, and there's a tiny bit of metal that's actually feeds into the figure, and you can just snap the figure off um, the mould rather than having to cut it. So getting that right is quite important. So I'll just demonstrate on the one and you basically put, I'm going to have to, excuse me, turn to face and you basically insert a knife, drag it along and there I'm going to do three points on this basically because that's what the old hobby products mould did and it works. So, okay, now ideally you do all of those like that but I'm going to do one at a time because I'm keeping track of where I made cuts. So you then take, can I have to wake up? You're going to do an increase of pressure as you cut and draw. So you only cut a little way in with the figure and a lot more there. So you press, cut, draw more pressure. Press, cut, more pressure and then sort of slide the knife and flick. Um, it's actually tall there, that's, that's fine. It's a very easy way of doing it. And we'll do again. Cut, flick, and I'll get rid of that because it's getting in the way. And again, Cut, press and cut. Okay. All right, so that's the, and you can, I don't know how well you can see, but there's a nice gate, very neatly done. And the one is designed to feed up the front legs, the one's designed to feed up the back legs, and this one makes sure the middle of the base um, fills with metal as well because you can get, if you just cut the two, you can have metal sort of not quite meeting there. Um, you can cut just one big central feed. Uh, I think this has great venting issues. And also, if you cut too big a one, when you try to pull the horse out, you will bend the base and it will bow. Um, I have a number of moulds from other manufacturers that are like that and basically they're a pain because the figure bends when you take them out. Um, I'll do all of these and cut back to it. You don't need to see me do every one. But the other thing I'm going to do is cut um, a spider leg vent on the tail. Because the leg comes up here, then the metal comes back to here, there's a chance that this bit of the tail won't fill properly, even though I've designed the mould to... Um, the metal will flow that way. So what we do is a very fine cut away from the edge towards the centre. And we'll just 
that out as you see and then ideally you want to cut to the edge and there's several ways of doing this you can cut individual ones or you can cut one round the whole of the outside and then feed all of them into there it's sort of easy to do that when you've got a lot of figures but I'll just demonstrate up to there so it's a slight angle that way and then a very slight angle cutting the other way I'll just nick that off and um, I'll show you the result in a minute but I'm going to end up doing a big ring vent there which will have several um, outlets to the outside um, the spider leg is so cool because it looks like a spider leg vent um, and the idea is the metal will only flow so far back to the center and so it will come down here and it will find it harder to get round that and up there if it's flowing really well it will get up there but when it will probably cool down quite a lot as well so it will stop before it gets to the outside so you won't be splashing metal out into the inside of your casting machine um, so again I'm going to pause and I'm going to cut the rest of the mould and show you what it's like okay so here we are the mould it's cut this side has nothing cut into it at all so it, you can bend it it's not, not going to tear it's quite strong importantly that base is is going to be good for the life of the mould um, you can see I cut a ring vent and then spider leg vents from each tail out to it that way I didn't have to cut all the way to the outside of the mould um, so this creates another bend and then a final vent on each horse so that the air can flow up there and there or out there and it's unlikely that any of the vents are going to clog with metal when you're casting um, so that should be ready to cast it needs talking and it needs identifying so first of all we're going to stick the mold back together and this is horse mold 16 so we're going to identify it with permanent marker and then the date um because i only make one mold a day <coughs> if i were to create a mold catalog i could do it by date and it would tell me what mold that was so i would give a reference number of 2012 19 and I would know from looking up that would be horse mold 16. It's PF because it's from Fed, from German for horse, because it's original hobby products of, of Germany mold. And again, I also write on the mold so that I can see what is uh, from the edge and there. Right, I also help spotting the notch by using the same mark I used on the can and putting a little bit of black there so you have every opportunity to see the mould lining marks from wherever you are as you can see gloves are shot I go through about a pair of mould um, so there we are. Um, I'll just give it a little talc ready for casting later and bang it in a box. Just from view, and you have a finished mould. That should work pretty well perfectly, uh, but we'll find out uh, in the next video uh, when we run it along with a lot of others I've made recently. I'm gradually remaking all the horse moulds that were hobby products. Uh, moulds for gladiator miniatures because they date from the 1980s some of them and they're in black rubber and they're beginning to show their own age they're very stiff 
and inflexible need to be quite warm to run properly and silicon moulds need less pressure to seal them and behave better for casting um, but that's a story for the next video